All right, everybody, thank you again, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, today, we are going to be talking about sustainability and community resiliency through solid waste investments and best practices. Um, before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Shawnee, who is going to go over some general housekeeping rules um, and explanations to help you guys get involved in this webinar when you have questions. So, Joe Shawnee. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. My name is Joe Shauna, and I am the admin of Adobe Connect. I just wanted to just go over some housekeeping things with you all in case you have not seen this Adobe Connect platform before. Welcome. I will only discuss these four boxes on the side because I think the presentation box and the caption box is uh, it's self-explanatory. Under the attendee box where you all are housed, there is a select to, a click to select eval box. You would click on that SurveyMonkey link and it will take you to SurveyMonkey to complete your level one evaluation. If you guys forget because of this wonderful information that is being shared today, you will get an email tomorrow morning just to remind you. The box below is the click to select files. That is where this presentation is housed for you guys. And all you would do is you would click on where you see PDF, Sustainable and Resilient Communities. Once you do that, the Download Files button will appear and it will allow you to download the presentation and it will allow you to view, save, and or print. The last box. Type your questions here. If you're having any technical issues or if you're having any comments, concerns, or questions about the content being presented today, you will enter your question or your comment or your issue into that box, and we will see it. And if it's technical, I will troubleshoot immediately. If it has something to do with the content, your presenters will inform you of how your questions will be addressed. Again, thank you for registering and participating in our event today. Have a great meeting, guys. Thank you so much for that. And just for everybody that is hopping on, we will plan to take questions at the end formally, and some of our presenters might um, answer you guys throughout the presentation um, if possible. But some of your questions we're going to save till the end to address to everybody. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Clay with HUD to get this presentation moving and started. Thank you, Michaela. Hi, everyone. My name is Clay Lloyd. I'm a Community Development and Planning Specialist at HUD in the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division. And today's presentation, as Michaela mentioned, is with our partners over at EPA uh, focused on solid waste management. And before we hand it over to our uh, team at EPA, uh, I wanted to go through some of the um, HUD instructions and information. So uh, the objectives for this presentation uh, is to learn what constitutes solid waste and solid waste management activities. To get a better, oh, I'm sorry, there's uh, some movement on the presentation slides here. Let me try and get it back. Okay. To uh, get a better understanding of the criteria to determine if a project is eligible under both CDBG DR or CDBG MIT funds, and to gain effective strategies to avoid common mistakes made when implementing a solid waste related project. Uh, and our speakers today are myself, as well as Melissa Capps and Paul Fraticelli. And we also have several other members on the EPA team that are available at the end to uh, answer any questions that you have, uh, technical regarding solid waste, or in general around activities that you're considering uh, to include with solid waste. So a whole, an overview of the uh, HUD requirements. The purpose for CDBG DR, uh, as we've mentioned in our previous webinars, um, it, we provide funds to grantees to develop viable communities. We provide decent housing, a suitable living environment, et 
expanding economic opportunities, primarily for low and moderate income persons. And um, our funds, they must be a CDBG eligible activity. Uh, they must meet a national objective. And they must address a direct or indirect impact from the major disaster in a presidentially declared county. I want to now go in and just as a primer um, give some uh, ideas around solid waste and how you might be interacting with it uh, with your CDBG DR uh, programs. So under the housing activities, we have acquisition, demolition, rehabilitation, and new construction. And some of the ways uh, programs that might have been created by grantees are multifamily affordable housing, single family rehab rehabilitation programs, or our buyout programs. Um, and all of those activities have potential solid waste costs. So things that are considered solid waste in those activities are recycling, construction debris, and even contractor debris removal. Another consideration for 2017, 2018, and 2019 grantees is in your Federal Register notice, you'll find that a green building standard must be met for new construction and replacement of substantially damaged residential buildings. Uh, under many of these green building standards, uh, there's several different ways you can meet that standard. Uh, the disposition of construction materials is considered solid waste. Another way that you might encounter uh, solid waste is non-substantially damaged residential buildings, according to the Federal Register Notice, will follow the guidelines in the HUD CPD Green Building Retrofit Checklist. For CDBG DR economic development activities, uh, you may be un uh, creating programs to create or retain jobs, specifically creating a workforce training program and while housing trades and construction trades are common workforce training programs under CDBGDR, uh, there is a potential to create a solid waste trade uh, workforce training program. Also in CDBGDR for infrastructure activities, uh, you may undertake programs for public facility improvements and public improvements. And uh, areas that deal with solid waste under those activities are water and sewage treatment plants, power and electrical grid work, as well as solid waste management facilities. Another thing to note for 2017, 2018, and 2019 grantees under your Federal Register notice is that disaster preparedness and mitigation measures should be integrated into infrastructure activities including how they will promote community level and or regional post-disaster recovery and mitigation planning. So you may be considering how to manage solid waste after your disaster in this context. All right, and we also have uh, grantees who received uh, CDBG MIT funds or mitigation funds. And to go through the CDBG MIT purpose, uh, these funds are a little different in that they represent a unique and significant opportunity for grantees to give, be, use assistance in areas impacted by recent disasters to carry out strategic and high impact activities, focusing on mitigating disaster resist, risks and reducing future losses. For these programs, they must meet the definition of a mitigation activity. They must address current and future risks as identified in the grantee's mitigation needs assessment of most impacted and distressed areas. They must be a CDBG eligible activity. And finally, they also must meet a national objective. Another thing to consider for CDBG MIT's purpose is uh, the funds are used to support infrastructure projects, housing activities, public services, economic development, and disaster preparedness and planning efforts. 
They're meant to increase resilience and reduce or eliminate risk. 50% of CDBG mix funds must also be used to benefit low to moderate income persons. And a little bit different than the CDBG DR uh, Federal Register notices, you'll notice in your CDBG MIT notice that green building standards are only recommended, not required. Lastly, there's a specific reference to solid waste in the CDBG MIT Federal Register Notice uh, under infrastructure, under the list of potential activities that you can take for infrastructure projects and activities. Um, summarizing it, after the disasters, the process of disaster debris and solid waste can become overwhelming due to damage or increased volume of processing. Uh, mitigation programs could address that identified risk. Infrastructure activities could include solid waste facility improvements, and planning activities could include developing risk reduction plans, which can help with continuity of operations in solid waste management. Great. So that concludes the HUD portion of this webinar. Now I want to hand it over to the EPA team for their presentation. And just as a quick reminder, if you have questions, please type them into the chat. And we have a team at EPA and Michaela and myself at HUD to answer any questions that come up. So with that, I'll hand it over to EPA. Hello. Thank you, Clay, and um, everyone at HUD for having us here to speak with everyone today on sustainable and resilient communities through solid waste investments and best practices after a disaster. Okay. Before I get started, I just want to bring your attention to the disclaimer on the screen. The views expressed in the presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views or policies of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So today's presentation will discuss the eligibility of solid waste projects funded through the Community Development Block Grants, the CDBG Grants, and best practices for solid waste management to protect human health and the environment, to make communities economically stronger, more sustainable, and resilient. But first, I would like to provide you with some background on what is solid waste and debris, and why planning for solid waste and debris is so important. Solid waste generally means any garbage or refuge resulting from industrial, commercial, mining, and agricultural operations and from community activities. Everything we do, or nearly everything we do, generates some kind of solid waste. On the other hand, debris generally means the material and waste streams resulting from a natural disaster. Waste is normally something that gets disposed of in a landfill, but material um, can be reused as is or be recycled into something else. For purposes of management, and planning, debris is too broad of a term. The more debris can be broken down into individual streams, more management options become available for the debris, including reuse and recycling. So as I just mentioned, debris is the material and waste streams resulting from a natural disaster. Most debris streams can either be material or waste. The decision on whether a particular debris stream is material or waste in a specific community can be made prior to a natural disaster and documented in a pre-incident de pre debris management plan. The more planning that is done before a disaster, the more likely the debris will be segregated into different debris streams and able to be managed as material. Planning provides the community with an opportunity to assess the capabilities of their existing solid waste infrastructure 
and make improvements to it or find alternative options if necessary. A community's goal should be to try to manage the debris as sustainably as possible. To increase sustainability, a community can increase the amount of debris that is managed as material than waste. Some debris streams, due to their volumes or due to limited available capacities at waste management facilities, may need to be managed as both materials and waste. It does not have to be an all or nothing approach for, the, uh, for each debris stream. Some debris streams may need to be managed solely as waste, like medical waste and commingled debris. Commingled debris is a mixture of many debris types, such as construction and demolition debris, vegetative debris, household hazardous waste, and building content. Because the debris streams are mixed up in a big pile, commingled debris will likely have to be landfilled. Therefore, it is really important for our community to separate commingled debris into individual debris streams as much as possible. This allows for different management strategies, such as reuse, recycling, and composting, to be applied to different debris streams. This diagram, this visual on the screen, is going to look unique for each community. With the actions you take before, during, and after a disaster, you decide how it will look. You can see the range of debris streams that communities may have to manage after a natural disaster. And there may be many others depending on the characteristics of your community. To mitigate the negative impact of debris, debris should be segregated as much as possible. Even the categories on the screen can be broken down further. For example, construction and demolition debris can be broken down further into metals, bricks, concrete, lumber, and asphalt shingles. Also, um, your system, your solid waste system, should be made more robust so that it can handle these debris streams, preferably as materials. The, your solid waste system and infrastructure should be developed to match the debris you expect will be generated by a disaster. Debris generated by natural disasters can cause many challenges. These are just some of the challenges that communities may face after a natural disaster. Pre-incident planning can help with these challenges. For example, there may be a larger quantity of debris. The amount of debris generated may be greater than the amount of waste or debris many communities typically handle in a year. That may overwhelm community resources and waste management facilities. By planning before a natural disaster occurs, Communities can forecast how much debris may be generated and identify additional waste management facilities and other resources that may be needed to handle the increased volume of debris. Also, there may be a wider variety of debris. A natural disaster may generate a broad range of debris streams, including ammunition, animal carcasses, construction demolition debris, vegetative debris, and white goods. Each of these debris streams may require a different management strategy, or they should have different management strategies. Pre-incident planning can include determining which debris streams may be generated in the community and what requirements may apply to those specific debris streams. There also might be a wider area of impact from the disaster. A natural disaster may impact an extremely large area. For example, an uh, area of several states. Multiple regulatory jurisdictions may then be involved with varying approaches to waste management, and all affected jurisdictions may be competing for the same resources. Before a natural disaster occurs, though, a community can identify and select waste management facilities and contractors that can be activated during a disaster. A community also may want to create memorandums of understanding with neighboring communities on resources. 
who are used during a disaster. And there, um, another challenge that may result is a change in public perception. The high visibility of the disaster due to its nature or its size may result in communities resisting the transportation of debris through their neighborhoods, for example, too many trucks on neighborhood roads, or the treatment or disposal of generated debris in their local facilities, such as the landfills. And these can include waste that would otherwise otherwise be managed at those facilities under normal conditions. During plans and planning, communities can develop a community communications outreach plan and begin implementing it before a disaster occurs. There are other challenges that may be caused by a disaster. There may be insufficient debris management capacity to handle surges in necessary recycling treatment and disposal of debris. There may be greater chances of local debris management facilities being impacted by the disaster, resulting in a possible decrease in existing capacity for generated debris and reduction of available debris management options. There also might be a greater risk of releases from facilities and sites that store chemicals, such as industrial facilities or Superfund sites and brownfields, and that can and that can contaminate debris. Communities can take action for a disaster to mitigate these challenges as well. So debris from disasters can impact communities in other ways. It costs a lot to manage debris that is generated. As you can see, debris removal is the third largest cost across FEMA's emergency response work. Debris can also block roads that are needed by emergency vehicles and can block important infrastructure like hospitals. Debris can also threaten human health in the environment. There are even more social, economic, and environmental impacts that debris has on communities, including soil, waste, and air pollution, and promoting illegal dumping and burning. These impacts show the importance of removing debris as fast as possible from a community with limited cost, with pre-incident planning, which pre-incident planning can help with. Removing the debris is an important sign of recovery that residences, that residents and businesses will see, and recovery is not complete until all debris is removed and managed. Debris management is more than just removing debris from neighborhoods and sending it to a facility. As you can see from the slide, debris management includes waste estimating, staging, sampling, characterization, packaging, transportation, reuse, recycling, treatment, and disposal, as well as other activities. The good news is, though, that communities can begin planning for all of these activities before a disaster occurs helping not only with managing disaster debris, but also with improving day-to-day -day solid waste activities. Paul will talk more about some of these activities in more detail later in the presentation. EPA developed the Planning for Natural Disaster Debris Guidance, or PNDD, to help communities plan for and manage debris from natural disasters, including hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, volcanoes, floods, wildfires, and winter storms. Planning for natural disaster debris is very important. The PNDD explains why planning is important and how planning and documenting that planning into a debris management plan can help with the response and recovery to a disaster. For example, planning saves valuable time and resources during a disaster, ensures the maximum recovery of materials, allows for more efficient and effective waste management decision-making during a disaster, and it can boost the community's resiliency, resulting in a quicker and less costly recovery to a stronger post-disaster state. A debris management plan helps the community know where they are now and helps the community get to where they want to go. The 
CNDD also provides information, case studies, and resources to assist communities with their pre-incident planning. I want to emphasize that the time and the effort you put into planning does make a large impact on the response and recovery. This is another tool that EPA has. It's the Disaster Debris Recovery Tool. This tool can help you identify places to send debris for its recovery or disposal, especially if the infrastructure in your, com in your community is damaged from the disaster or has limited capacity. I have touched upon how disaster debris can challenge and negatively impact communities and how planning can help mitigate these impacts. Now we'll talk about many of the benefits that mitigation can provide to a community. Having resilient solid waste infrastructure and sustainable materials materials management strategies can help a community recover faster, which encourages residences, residents and businesses to stay in the area, helping to reestablish community lifelines. It helps the communities be stronger and stay intact. Also, these strategies can help the community identify the harmful materials in the community so that when a disaster happens, the community contains less harmful materials that can be released minimizing hazardous debris and possible contamination. The strategies also can help community generate less debris. Um, less debris means spending less money on cleanup and on debris management. And it, in my opinion, this is the most important one because with less debris, everything else becomes easier. You don't have to make this, the decision if something is material or a waste. It's made for you pretty much because everything remains a material. It remains in use. And also, these strategies can help a community use fewer resources to rebuild, resulting in fewer emergency response and disaster recovery costs. There are, more, there are stronger and more resilient buildings in the a community as a result. Okay, so in summary, solid waste can generally be thought of as what is generated by a community on a day-to-day -day basis. It's predictable in both quantity and composition week after week. Debris, though, um, can generally be thought of what is generated as a result of a natural disaster, and while planning can help determine what that debris will look like and how much debris may be generated, the exact quantity and composition are dependent on the scale and type of natural disaster. Because solid waste and disaster debris contain many of the same material and waste streams, improving the management of one helps the other. A strong, resilient solid waste infrastructure means having the ability to manage more debris as materials more quickly. And planning for natural disaster debris provides an opportunity to assess and make improvements to solid waste infrastructure. The rest of this presentation will go into more detail on how investing in planning, infrastructure, housing, and economic development can help prevent or reduce the negative impacts of solid waste and debris before and after a disaster. And now I'll pass it on to Paul. Uh, thank you, Melissa, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining uh, today. So far, we have talked about what is generally solid waste and debris, the challenges they could represent to communities, and the various opportunities and benefits when we mitigate and address those challenges through disaster debris planning and investments. Following the waste management hierarchy is one of the best practices that will help your decision making as you develop CBBGDRs and MIT programs to support solid waste and disaster debris activities. The waste management hierarchy ranks the various management strategies for most to least environmentally preferred. The hierarchy places emphasis on reducing, reusing, and recycling 
as key to sustainable material management of solid waste and debris. Therefore, you want to develop programs that follow the hierarchy from the most desirable option to the least desirable option. That is the ideal. However, impacts from a disaster are unpredictable. Despite your best efforts to follow the hierarchy, you may find communities with urgent needs on treatment and disposal rather than energy recovery, for example. The most important thing is to identify unmet needs in your analysis to determine where is your community in each one of the management strategies in the hierarchy and start planning from there. The planning of source reduction and reuse, recycling, composting, energy recovery, treatment and disposal can be conducted simultaneously. Considering the waste management hierarchy in your program development process will help create programs that will help the reduction of debris resulting from disasters. The most desirable option is to invest in source reduction and reuse and in recycling and composting activities. Uh, these investments include, but are not limited to, infrastructure that facilitates the recovery and processing of materials for reuse. We mentioned earlier that you decide whether debris resulting from a disaster turn into a material or waste. A strong infrastructure system that includes material recovery facilities and composting facilities will support the implementation of recycling composting practices that not only will help to handle surges of materials uh, after disaster, but also will help the community in their day-to-day -day operations. In the beginning of the webinar, uh, we mentioned uh, an overview of hot activities interacting with solid waste and disaster debris activities. Uh, I will be sharing now an expanded description of possible solid waste and disaster debris activities that could be aligned with HUD, CDBGDR, and NEET activities. First of all, you want to assess the existing solid waste infrastructure in your community to help develop a tailored plan for solid waste management before, during, and after disasters. A robust solid waste infrastructure will provide better services to your community. Assess your solid waste infrastructure prior and after a disaster and identify there are met needs in your analysis. We talked a moment ago about infrastructure supporting recycling and composting practices. Let's talk now about infrastructure that support energy recovery and treatment and disposal included in the waste management hierarchy. The purpose of a landfill is to manage waste and to protect the environment from contaminants, uh, which these contaminants uh, may be present you know, in the solid waste disposed at the facility. Within a landfill, you will find various components such as landfill liner, leachate collection and treatment system, and even uh, methane gas uh, recovery equipment. You want to include all landfill components in your map need assessment to determine if the facility is operating well and if it is in need of any improvements. Another infrastructure that supports treatment and disposal and energy recovery strategies are waste to energy facilities. Waste to energy facilities convert non-recyclable waste materials into electricity. Benefits of this technology include the stabilization of the electrical grid, reduction of energy costs, and support jobs creation. Investments on infrastructure that support the hierarchy's energy recovery and treatment and disposal strategies will minimize hazardous debris and possible contamination from daily operations and after disaster.
additional sites supporting uh, waste, uh, solid waste and debris management include transfer stations, community drop-off centers, and temporary debris sites. Transfer stations are building or processing sites where garbage trucks deposit waste and or materials temporarily. In short, it is a site for consolidation of segregated materials and or solid waste prior to transport to a processing or disposal facility. Uh, community drop-off centers are part of the materials and waste collection systems in communities. These are sites where community members can bring their materials to a specific location with proper safety measures. For day-to-day -day operations and after disasters, uh, community drop-off centers are very valuable. Ask yourself how many times you've looked for a place to bring unused batteries and electronics. Well, uh, that could be a community drop-off center. After a disaster, people may be looking where to drop their electronics and white goods damaged by floods and, land and landslides. And community drop-off centers can help on that. Temporary debris sites are locations established in disaster-affected areas that cannot take disaster-related debris from an existing collection point. Remember, disaster can generate more debris than what a community normally handles. Temporary debris sites may be needed to manage surges in materials. These sites require local permits, so including the pre-establishment of temporary debris sites in your disaster debris planning will support a rapid response. And disaster debris planning is one of the various activities that interact with CDBGDR and mitigation activities. It is important to develop plans implementing mitigation measures to prevent solid waste generation and contamination resulting from a disaster. Other examples of planning activities related to solid waste and disaster debris include updating building codes to incorporate resiliency in structures. Look, structures without resiliency measures are debris waiting to happen. By, ex by extending the useful lifetime of a building, you are reducing the amount of debris that will need to be managed after a disaster. Planning can help weight which buildings have reached the end of their useful lifetime and which buildings can have their lifetimes extended through improvements. You also want to develop programs that help communities identify abandoned buildings and other type of buildings, which deconstruction can reduce the risk, of, the risk of them becoming debris. You also want to plan the development of a tailored community outreach and education program to promote waste reduction, waste reduction best practices. Uh, you may have questions about, is it best through social media? Is it, is it, best, is it, is it best through email? Uh, is it best uh, implement education through visits to recycling facilities? Uh, what is the demographic of the community that you want to impact? Your planning exercise can help respond to these questions and other questions. And the CDBGDR and NEED funds can help on this and more. When it comes to the actual implementation of community outreach and education programs, uh, let us think about the public service category. Uh, examples of topics under uh, these type of education programs may include sustainable material management and disaster debris management, educating and engaging communities, build trust with government entities and community members, Communities can learn and implement source reduction practices, recycling and composting, and all of this will help to reduce uh, the, the, the generation of debris. Education efforts can really help preserve space in landfills as well. Support pre-incident planning. 
to increase sustainable material management. In your program development, incorporate and incentivize partnerships between neighboring jurisdictions. This will really help your disaster debris management and help the development of reuse and recycling markets. Remember that one of the main goals is to bring back recovered materials into the economy. During day-to-day -day operations and after disasters, communities may produce materials that neighbor jurisdictions may need for economic development activities and also disaster recovery activities. Also, some communities may not, may not have the infrastructure to handle surges in debris resulting from disasters. Establishing partnerships to implement debris management planning at a regional scale allow for a faster emergency response and recovery. The EPA Disaster Debris Recovery Tool can help with this. Assisting local governments to improve their daily operation plans for solid waste infrastructure and management can help reduce debris management costs. Managing large amount of debris after disaster is expensive. You want to think about programs that build the planning capacity of local governments and operators of solid waste infrastructure, material recovery facilities, and composting facilities. These planning activities may include, but are not limited to, operation plans and a smart curbside pickup routes. As we've discussed so far, planning activities can really make a difference in many areas of solid waste and disaster debris management. Let's now move to infrastructure activities. Some examples of activities under infrastructure include the actual construction of solid waste processing and disposal facilities, an improvement, an improvement needed to support the closure of open dumps. Unattended open dumps can become human-made hazards that can compromise availability of drinking water sources and environmental protection, resulting in adverse effects when trying to reestablish community lifelines after a disaster. Strengthening solid waste infrastructure for day-to-day -day operations will translate to more effective and efficient management of solid waste and debris streams generated after disasters. Other examples include the expansion of reuse and recycling uh, operations. Uh, again, this will help to preserve landfill space. It also includes infrastructure improvements to support compliance with permits, operations, and environmental requirements from a local government and the federal government. Uh, you want to develop programs that help solid waste and material management infrastructure be in good shape to sustain the day-to-day -day operations and also disaster events. Such programs can support local environmental departments, counties, municipalities, and communities. Economic development activities also have interactions with solid waste and disaster debris. While you and or your subgrantee develop plans to implement infrastructure improvements and other mitigation measures, you also want to consider the creation of workforce development programs on environmental skill trade to support the long-term implementation of the developed plans. Also, workforce development programs can support sustainable reconstruction and recovery efforts. For example, uh, community members with skill sets for sanitation, recycling, and reuse occupations can augment the local capacity in handling solid waste and materials resulting from recovery activities. Improving economic growth through green businesses and jobs opportunities will help to reduce debris and will help communities to recover faster.
we talked earlier about how updating building codes and planning for the sustainable deconstruction of the structures can help on reducing debris generation. The actual repairs and improvements to implement updated building codes to make housing resilient will interact with housing activities. Same will apply when it comes to, act to, to the action of deconstructing housing in a sustainable manner. Deconstruction is the process of carefully dismantling buildings to salvage components for reuse and recycling. Deconstruction can be applied on many levels to salvage usable materials and significantly cut waste. As mentioned, source reduction is the most preferred option for material management. This matrix uh, pulled together all activities, and, and it, is a, it reflects a summary of examples of HUD, CDBG, DDR, and CDBG mid type of activities interacting with solid waste and disaster debris. Uh, you can use it as, as a reference to assist your decision making on program development. To complete our presentation today, I would also like to share other general best practices that will help you leverage federal funds to provide relief to solid waste and disaster debris needs. I would also like to share a success story EPA learned about uh, through our engagements uh, in the Caribbean. So let's begin with the additional best practices. Build capacity on grant writing and grant management in your community. This will provide communities self-service when it comes to addressing needs on solid waste and sustainable material management. Capitalize on disaster recovery funds and federal recurrent funds. Federal agencies such as USDA, EDA, and EPA have non have have non-disaster related funds available on a recurring basis that can also help support your solid waste and debris management activities. This is where having people in communities and local government departments dedicated on grant writing and management is very handy. Also, implement federal match programs that support solid waste and disaster debris activities. Remember that the FEMA funds and other federal funds uh, may have a state, a state match requirement. Also, get the private sector involved early in the process as they can support the long-term implementation of various of the activities discussed today. And perhaps this is uh, one of the most important best practices, you know, to share uh, today, and that is that get your mitigation project listed in the local mitigation plan. Meet with your state hazard mitigation officer, officer uh, to coordinate, since uh, solid waste mitigation projects that are listed in the local mitigation plan become eligible for certain federal funding very important, you know, to get uh, your project listed in the local mitigation plan. Through EPA engagements in the Caribbean, we learn about what the Puerto Rico Department of Housing is doing with their CDBG DR and MID funds. The Puerto Rico Housing Department have developed various programs that can possibly provide relief to solid waste and debris challenges after Hurricane Maria. Their CDBG DR action plan includes infrastructure and economic programs that support solid waste improvement and economic growth on sustainable material man management. Also, their planning programs may provide funds for the various planning activities interacting with solid waste 
and disaster debris at a regional, local, and community scale. They've been stewards in Puerto Rico on engagements with federal agencies, local practitioners, and the general public to learn about solid waste and debris needs, challenges, and opportunities. All of this to support the development of their CDBG Meet Action Plan. Uh, I bet this is one of, of many examples uh, nationwide, and we at EPA are eager to learn more about them. We look forward to hear from other uh, HUD grantees, and, and, and we look forward to, to pursue collaboration with you. Remember, investments on solid waste and debris management will bring sustainability and resilience to communities. It will help them to recover faster and reduce adverse impacts from disasters. Well, thank you all for your attention. And now I will pass it off to Clay. Great. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Okay, I, I want to thank Paul and Melissa for um, giving that great presentation. Um, I know it, solid waste is something that, uh, at least on the HUD uh, side, we haven't talked too much about before. So it's great when we can kind of expand um, our knowledge and understanding um, of other issues that come up during disasters and start to think about how us and grantees can um, address these issues. Um, so that was really helpful. And I, I know, you know, thinking back, uh, several of our, of our grantees um, in the past have definitely dealt with issues uh, around kind of the bottleneck of um, disaster debris and solid waste that happens right after a disaster. So if, if, if they, um, you know, start to get to think about how to plan to be more resilient for that or what kind of facility improvements that can be made on the infrastructure side, um, especially in the CDBG MIT uh, side of things. I think this was a, a great chance for them to kind of see all those types of activities that they can undertake. Um, so now I, I, what I'd like to do is we can go into a question and answer um, section. Um, we have time to answer questions that you may have, anyone who's in attendance. Um, so if you notice, there's a question box at the bottom right um, where it says type your questions here, and we can go through those and start to answer, answer them. So if you have a question, please submit it there. Um, and we already have a couple of questions that have come in. The first one um, came in earlier, and uh, the question was, what role does the private sector play in a waste management plan? Is there a market for debris and waste that would bring in private sector resources? So um, does anyone on HUD want to answer that question? Okay, I, we have a, um, in, until uh, one of our presenters has their mic working, he also typed out a response here. So um, the response was the private sector can play a, a big role in debris recovery. Uh, metals can be recovered where metal collectors pay for bulk metal. Selected wood can be recycled into wood pellets for pellet stoves. So those were two of the suggestions he has, and uh, if we get his mic working. Uh, he can definitely go into more. Okay, um, I think I think another question uh, that at least I have uh, that's that's coming up is, you know, what what's one thing uh, for the attendees? Uh, what's one thing that they can think about or add, um, or what they can consider? Um, when they're thinking about how to address uh, 
future issues during a disaster in your specific field. So I'm going to open this up to everyone uh, who's on the EPA side. If, what's one thing a grantee can consider to address um, during a disaster in your work? Hi, this is uh, th th this is Paul Frey Shelley. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I believe you know one of the one of the things to think about, in particular when you are establishing the temporary debris sites, is to practice uh, segregation of uh, the materials that will be uh, getting into these uh, sites. Uh, I think that that is certainly something that that you you know you need to plan for. You know how how that site will be arranged uh, to uh, provide the needed space for uh, the implementation of segregation practices. Uh, so, 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 so that's why you know the, the disaster uh, debris planning uh, becomes uh, uh, very important. Uh, not only uh, you know not only brings the opportunity to uh, recover uh, materials. But, but also it, it will help uh, a rapid opening of these uh, temporary debris sites when needed. So having uh, these sites reestablished uh, with the needed space for the uh, segregation practices, uh, that's, that's certainly something uh, to think about. That's great. Appreciate that, Paul. Um, is there anyone else who wants to jump in and answer that? Hi, this is um, Christina. Thank you, everybody. I learned a lot myself today. Um, one of, I come from uh, the area of sustainable materials management and resiliency. And so one of, I think, the most critical um, tasks that a community or grantee can take on is um, a planning. And perhaps Melissa will want to say a little more about that. Um, but in your plan, it's really important to, to look at how you can just, right from the beginning, generate less debris to begin with. And that way, everything becomes easier. Um, so take a look when you're doing your plan at items like what are your building codes? How can you build greener structures? Um, what buildings need to be deconstructed? Where can you send those materials um, back into the market so that um, when a disaster happens again, which we hope it doesn't, you will have less debris to deal with um, in the beginning. So making sure when you're doing your plan, you don't just look at what happens after a disaster, but what you can do before a climate event to make the outcome um, less impactful in a negative way. Uh, Christina, uh, this is Melissa. Uh, just to add to that, um, my job it was about how to manage debris that is generated by a disaster, and it would be so much easier if, um, for me, if um, debris um, wasn't generated at all. Um, so I really just want to second what Christina was saying about just finding ways to minimize the debris that can be generated. Um, we are planning for natural disaster debris talks goes into a lot of detail on different ways um, once debris is generated, how to gen um, how to manage it in a way that is more sustainable and doesn't that it doesn't have to go into a landfill. What else can we that could be done with this debris so it's not just a negative for a community. How can it be turned into a positive? 
And a lot of that is going to take planning. Without planning, there is um, a tremendous pressure after a disaster just to get everything cleaned up. And the fastest way to clean everything up is just keep it in the big piles in which it was generated and just throw it into a landfill. But of course, once it's in the land, it's going to stay there and provide no further benefit. Um, to keep it out of the landfill will take planning. And writing a debris management plan is really the best way to think through the issues and document the, um, them so that everyone in the community, the whole community, understands that they are and can work towards the same goal. Yeah, that's great, Melissa. That's a great point. Um, I, I do think a lot of grantees are, you know, are often wondering how they can, um, through the planning process, kind of optimize for next time so that they're not dealing with that same bottleneck issue. Um, let's see, does anyone else want at, at EPA want to speak to that? Yeah, so this is Dale Carpenter, uh, EPA Region 2. Uh, a number of things that we've had experience here in Region 2, which covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, so we've, we've had our number of uh, natural disasters that we've had to deal with. Some things we found are, uh, again, um, the need for pre-established temporary debris management areas, or TDMAs where a de debris can be staged and segregated, and um, the need for uh, standby contracts to both manage debris and track debris. Uh, that is uh, subject to reimbursement by FEMA. Uh, so it's important to uh, follow certain protocols so that municipalities can be uh, reimbursed for those activities. Um, we also experienced, uh, as somebody mentioned about what is the value in private sector, how is private sector involved? They're involved in these standby contracts. They're also involved in managing debris post, post disaster. Uh, many of the debris, much of the debris generated does have value. Uh, either uh, a lot of vegetative debris can be reused in, in our particular experience in Puerto Rico. There's a valuable tropical hardwoods that could be recovered for uh, for using those materials um, uh, and uh, other vegetative debris could be used to generate uh, mulch and other uh, compost, for example. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Um, great. Uh, and I think another question you know, some of the grantees are wondering about is on the, um, you know, that was a great kind of transition to thinking about uh, use of the non-federal cost share uh, component of CDBG funds. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear if anyone wants to share about how other agencies like FEMA, um, I know USDA and uh, EPA's Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds all might be doing work around solid waste. So does anyone want to speak more to kind of what that type of work looks like um, so that our grantees can get a sense of uh, maybe they want to partner with, uh, on some of those projects with their funds? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is this is Paul. Uh, I mean, when, when, when we when we think about the, the clean water uh, state revolving funds. Uh, these, uh, this, this uh, funding source, which is managed uh, by uh, states, uh, could be used for uh, implementation of practices uh, in uh, landfill facilities that will help protect underground water sources. Uh, as we mentioned in the presentation, you know, when 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 you do when you do not have a proper uh, operation uh, of a solid waste facility, uh, that 
may result in possible contamination of uh, drinking water sources. Uh, these, uh, so, so certainly when, when, when you are trying to capitalize uh, on the using the clean water state revolving funds, you have to establish that linkage, right, on how the uh, proposed uh, project, you know, will help the protection of, uh, of the environment, uh, in particular when we're talking about uh, underground, uh, uh, underground drinking water sources. Uh, the, yes, I mean, that, 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 that program has a, a matching requirement um, by the, you know, to, to, that, that the private applicant, you know, is responsible for. Uh, so, so yes, I mean that, that, that that's that's a possible funding source where uh, uh, a federal match program, you know, can help uh, sub applicants, you know, to have access to in the event that the sub applicants uh, cannot afford that, that that matching requirement. Great, awesome, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I can also right. speak um, on. Um, yeah, just, just quickly, I mean, I, I, I also would like to speak, you know, on, on USDA. I mean, they, they, they do have available uh, a recurrent uh, grant and loan program that, that is called uh, the, waste and, uh, the Waste and Water uh, Program. Uh, that, I mean, certainly I'm not uh, very familiar with all the requirements, but, but yes, many of these programs you know, uh, may have uh, uh, may have the federal matching uh, requirement. So, so certainly, uh, as we shared, you know, one of the strategies is you know to to, to establish, uh, you know, when possible, these uh, federal matching programs with uh, CDBGDR and mitigation funds, uh, because uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can it can help the implementation not only of of FEMA projects, also projects that that other uh, federal agencies can 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 sponsor through funding. Awesome. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's great to hear about. Because um, I think several of our our grantees may be trying to look at the non-federal cost share um, uh, component as they you know start to look at their infrastructure activities that they're taking on. Okay, uh, are there any further questions in the chat? Okay, um, looks like we, we may have uh, Okay, we have one more question here. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, I would like to know how repair and reuse infrastructure projects may be funded. So um, I think just answering it on the HUD side, um, infrastructure activities for both CDBG DR and CDBG MIT uh, funding sources. Um, they're both eligible activities um, and they focus on the repair and improvement of public facilities including um, you know drinking water, uh, clean water treatment plants, and solid waste treatment plants. And um, I guess the question for, for you guys is um, do you, you know, on the clean water, drinking water, SRF fund, um, what kind of typical projects are undertaken for improvements and repairs after a storm? Yes, so, so, so we have seen, uh, what, what we have seen in, in particular in the experience that, that we have had in Puerto Rico is that, that uh, many 
uh, water related projects uh, are the one that, that has been uh, that, the, that the Clean Water State Revolving Fund has been receiving uh, applications. Uh, normally, the, the application process includes uh, an application package that you know, will provide a scope of a project and, and also uh, technical information uh, along with, with uh, budget information. Um, but yeah, generally, at least in, in, in the experience that, that we have had in the Caribbean, it's mostly uh, water projects. Great. Yeah, and I think in the past, our grantees have, like, um, focused on um, their capacity improvements at the facility, um, being able to handle the potential incoming, you know, uh, uh, both solid waste and disaster debris uh, from future events that are, you know, similar uh, to the previous disaster. So if your disaster has <clears throat> experienced some kind of damage in your capacity, making sure that you're building it back um, so they can handle future disasters um, is something to consider with your infrastructure activities, uh, with your CWG DR and CWG NIT funds. All right, and I think uh, we have another uh, question from Kimi Pro, but I might uh, just follow up with you um, via email just to make sure I'm answering your other, the other parts of your question um, uh, appropriately. Um, what I'll do here is if there's no, no other questions, um, I'll go through the, the end of the slides here. Um, first, I want to thank Joshani and Michaela over at HUD for setting up the presentation. And then I want to uh, thank all of the EPA presenters um, and people involved in helping to develop the presentation. Uh, they're on the screen there, Melissa, Paul, Christina, Kevin, Craig, and Dale. Um, I think this was a great introduction into solid waste um, and having our grantees think about the possibilities of doing planning work around solid waste, infrastructure work in solid waste, but also economic development and housing as well. Um, so I want to leave our grantees here um, with some resources. These are uh, links that the EPA team um, gave to us if you want to learn more about any of the content that they talked about during the presentation. And this webinar um, is one in a series uh, that we've been putting on uh, due to um, the previous uh, workshop being canceled, we're doing a series of webinars. The, there are four other upcoming webinars that you can take a part of. Uh, they're on the screen here. Uh, disaster recovery, infrastructure projects, duplication of benefits, and regional coordination. Uh, so if you're interested in signing up for any of these webinars as well, you can go to the HUD Exchange website and look for upcoming training. And lastly, if you have any further questions um, or you're trying to think about how to incorporate or address solid waste management in your programs, um, we have the contact information of everyone on the EPA side here. And um, also reach out to us in the policy unit at HUD. Um, the email is drsipolicyunit at hud.gov. Uh, we can definitely get back to you and help you problem solve any issues you may have uh, thinking around solid waste management. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you everyone for coming out and I look forward to seeing you at future webinars.